So uh, at the risk of monopolizing the conversation, um, <laughs> which, you know, is, is habitual, I, I want to make two things uh, clear. First of all, narcissistic, uh, psychopathic narcissists, also known as malignant narcissists, uh, first and foremost, narcissists. So everything I've said during this conversation applies to psychopathic narcissists. Everything I've said about narcissists applies to psychopathic narcissists as well. The second thing is, it's all about goal orientation. But here is a major distinction between narcissists and psychopaths. The narcissist's goal is himself. The goal of the narcissist is himself, self-aggrandizement, self-attraction, autoerotism, um, supply, etc. It's all about himself, while the psychopath's goal essentially is you. He wants to own you. He wants to control you. He wants to dominate you. He wants to have power over you. So the psychopath is capable of recognizing the externality and separateness of other people, unlike the narcissist. And the psychopath just wants to convert you into a possession, while the, the narcissist doesn't see you at all. You don't exist at all. You are figment in the narcissist's mind and imagination. And he interacts with you in ways that render him, him irresistible to himself, so that he can ultimately end up having sex with himself. So with that in mind, that brings me quite neatly round to um, the point about how how narcissists and psychopaths, the difference in how they interact with a potential love interest and the style of love bombing. Because unfortunately, um, or fortunately, however you want to view it, I've consumed a lot of your content. It's been enormously helpful to me and I imagine many others. So when I'm listening to what you have to say, it, it does, I look at things with a far more jaundiced eye and I start to see things that, you know, romantic tropes, romantic comedies, um, the, the way people perceive love and, uh, you know, this cult of uh, twin flames and soulmates, um, love at first sight. I, I'm now um, questioning that um, quite frequently. And it, I was reading um, the love letters between F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, um, Zelda Fitzgerald. Um, and the way that they were speaking to one another, it made me feel, you know, is, is this real love or is this just some form of, um, you know, psychopathic or narcissistic love bombing? Um, for instance, just to give you a quick example, um, Zelda sends a letter to Scott at the start of their courtship where she says, um, you know, if if you should die, I would have no purpose. Do you think I was made for you? Um, I feel like you had me ordered and I was delivered to you to be worn. I want you to wear me like a watch charm or a buttonhole bouquet to the world. And then when we're alone, I want to help to know that you can't do anything without me. Well, it sounds like um, a good script for a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There have been, uh, but, there have been, there have been a few serial kill killers, for example, Ed Gain who used to kind of flay their victims, take, take out the skin and wear the skin. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is very reminiscent of... So. Yeah, I mean, it's now I'm seeing that as, oh, that's really creepy. Whereas prior to all this knowledge about, you know, cluster B personality disorders, I would have thought, oh, that's lovely. You know, they really love each other. What a poetic way to express oneself. And now I'm thinking, is this, uh, should I run in the opposite direction? Yeah, running in the opposite direction might be a good idea. The, the thing is that the difference between healthy people and unhealthy people is that unhealthy people use sex and so-called love, it's not real love, they use them to for self-regulation. In other words, they make, they leverage um, the sex act, they leverage intimacy, they leverage romance, they leverage courting and flirting and sexual scripts, they leverage this whole thing in order to regulate something internally. So the narcissist regulates his sense of self-worth. The psychopath reduces his anxiety. Psychopaths, now we know, suffer from anxiety disorder. And the psychopathy is a kind of compensation. So I don't need to be anxious because I'm an animal. I don't need to be anxious because I'm a bully. I don't need to be anxious because I'm a bully. So, and they use other people 
in sexual context and emotional context and context of intimacy and romance and relationships and so on, they use other people. They self-medicate with other people. In the case of the psychopath, other people are anxiolytics. They are like the equivalent of anxiety medication. And in the case of the narcissist, they are kind of drugs. They are narcissists on a high when he consumes other people. But it's a, cons it's a consumer act. It's consumerism. Both psychopaths and narcissists consume other people. Whereas in healthy relationships, the people involved remain separate. They have boundaries. And they enrich a third entity, which is the relationship. The relationship is distinct from, the, from its participants. In psychopathy, in narcissism, there's merger and fusion for, for different reasons. The reasons are not the same. The etiology, the, the, the motivation is not the same. But the outcome is the same. You cease to exist. You cease to exist. And that's why you have this phenomenon of twin flames and soulmates. And yeah, it's, it's uh, people who believe they're twin flames or soulmates. Is it likely that one of those people is psychopathic or narcissistic? Or it's just that they're gullible and they've, they've bought into the cult? No, no, beyond, beyond, likely, beyond likely. Beyond yeah. likely. Beyond likely that one or both are narcissists or psychopaths. Maybe covert narcissist and overt narcissist, psychopath and covert narcissist. But there's a lot of narcissism and psychopathy in it. There is a, a wish, a wish to eliminate the partner by merging. You know, when 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 they say we are like one body, or we're, there, we're like one organism with two heads. And yeah. What, this what one. are we talking about? We are talking about eliminating the partner. It's a death wish for the partner. It's like I don't like you when you're separate. I want to consume you. I want to digest you. I want to assimilate you. I want you to not exist anymore except within me. So that's precisely what the narcissist does. He converts you into, in, into an internal object. And that's when exactly said, when what the psychopath it, does. Psychopath? When you put it like that, it's really not romantic whatsoever. It's not. It's a death, it's a death cult. Psychopathy and narcissism are extension of, extensions of what used to be known in psychoanalytic literature as the thematic drive, the, drive, the death drive. So in, in early psychoanalytic literature, they made a distinction between libido, which is the life force, and destudo, or motido, or later it was called thanatic, thanatos, which is the death drive. Psychopaths and narcissists regard other people either as objects to be consumed, that's the psychopath, or as non-existent, that's the narcissist. <laughs> so their world is solipsistic, is dead, they are dead inside, and they induce death. They bring death to the outside. They want you to die. It's about, they don't want you to live, they don't want you to flourish, they don't want you to prosper, they don't want you to have any autonomy or agency or they don't want you to exist because when you exist, you defy the narcissist's internal object, which is idealized. And when you exist, you defy the psychopath's power. In any case, your existence is an act of defiance, which needs to be put down. You need to be put down. You're like a rabid dog. You need to be put down. You're a danger to the What's internal that? stability of the psychopath and the narcissist. What would you say a, a, a few pointers when dating that people wouldn't often pick up on or you're not going to find necessarily, you know, on the these um, internet, you know, BuzzFeed, one, two, three articles that, that would indicate to someone that you're potentially dealing with someone who's psychopathic? I'm often asked uh, this question, and I think I authored the first article in the early 90s about how to, you know, how to identify a, a, a recognize a narcissist on the first date and this kind of thing. I think, um, first of all, review the power, the power matrix. Is, is your potential partner trying to take over? Is it a hostile takeover? Is there a transfer of power from yourself to your partner on a constant basis? Does he take over decision making, for example? This a process of disempowerment. It's like a, a leaking battery. 
Like, are you losing your power? Do you feel it that you're losing your power? Do you become more and more dependent, for example, on your partner's judgment, on the way he sees reality? Do you subject your own opinions to his? Does he become the yardstick and benchmark for everything and so on? So that's a crucial point. Second point is uh, alacrity, the speed. If, if your partner is moving too fast, inordinately and, and, and de it's in a deranged way, moving too fast, that's a very bad indication. I would be very, very careful with that. The next thing is a discrepancy between how your partner treats you and all other people. If he treats you nicely and demeans and humiliates other people, like waiters and cab drivers, and I don't know, that's a bad sign. If, on the other hand, he treats you abrasively, contemptuously, and rudely, and is very, very nice to other people, including cab drivers and waitresses and what have you, that's also a bad sign. If there is an incongruence between the way he treats you, for better or for worse, and the way he treats other people, there's something seriously wrong. All these are indicators to just walk away, cut it out, just break up and move on. In and terms of the charisma, though, that these people demonstrate, it's very alluring because, you know, on the, the dating scene at points, you're met, often met with these, you know, bumbling idiots or, you know, people who are just kind of, you know, bog standard or, or you know, that or they get things wrong. And after a while, you start to believe, you know, I, I do want someone special. I do want someone different, e even though ultimately, you know, everybody's going to get things wrong. We're all inherently flawed but you know you come across someone with 10 times the charisma of your, your standard date or possibly they look after themselves better they've got a more interesting job that's, or, that's a it, narcissistic it's a narcissistic approach to dating i'm sorry to say what you should be looking for is someone who cares for you someone who gives you space to be yourself someone who respects you oh no someone... this isn't necessarily how i i view dating it's more what i've heard from you know, women who are tired, often women, I will say men as well, but often women who are very tired of the dating scene and they're, you know, I yes, just keep because meeting they're looking the same for someone man. special Because they're looking for yeah. someone special. And they, they regard their potential relationships, intimate relationships, as a kind of a movie. Um, yeah, be, exactly, yeah. This is Disney, Disney approach. It's a Disney approach to dating. This Disney is one of the major engines of narcissism. In in modern civilization, I'm I'm not kidding. By the way, I sound as no, I believe you. No, I'm I believe kidding. you. Absolutely you know. not kidding. Hundred percent. The subliminal messages in in Disney movies are mostly narcissistic, and in many cases psychopathic, but mostly narcissistic. And so one of the, one of the main messages is: you are so special, you are so amazing, you are so fascinating and incredible that you deserve a prince. Because you're a princess and you're a goddess. And as a goddess, it is of a god, you know. The hidden messages are that you the only way to affirm and confirm your princess status, your uniqueness, your amazingness, is by finding a partner who is equally amazing and unique. And this is utterly narcissistic. It also happens to be wrong. It also but you feel it's don't you feel it's more endemic now, though, with with the culture of TikTok and of you know influencing and how pe the way people behave and view themselves? Um, you know, I feel that this this princess attitude in particular is a lot more common now. I'm seeing um, a lot of people saying, "Well, I this is what I deserve. I don't want to date a man who's making less than a hundred k a year. I don't want to um, date a man who hasn't." hasn't got his own business you know the, these standards whereby i would say even a decade ago these standards didn't exist you were as you say looking for people who would be kind to you would care for you would open the door for you even you know simple things that that yes. do amount to a lot yes because uh dating today is not about the other person it's about you it's about self-aggrandizing it's about augmenting your wealth or augmenting your power or augmenting your image and your status the other person is a consumable. 
the other person is is a is a commodity the other person is a gadget or a device <laughs> intended to uphold your view of yourself as a perfect entity so Isn't evidently that worrying? sorry isn't that very worrying, though, for the future and, and how people are well, going to start to interact with one another? 42% of adults nowadays in industrialized societies are single for life, lifelong single. Is that worrying? Well, it depends. I think the West is, is, is disappearing. I don't think. I mean, it's a fact. The West is disappearing. The number of live births is under the replacement rate. So all industrialized countries are losing population. That includes China, by the way. They're losing population. Ultimately, we're going to vanish. And our Western civilization is going to be replaced by other civilizations, obviously. It's a normal process. Narcissism is the way civilizations vanish. Narcissism is a disease that ruins, destroys civilization. And that Narcissism was at its height at the end of the Roman Empire, for example. So narcissism is the harbinger, the sign of a malaise that destroys the social fabric to the point that an entire civilization vanishes. It's like a fung uh, it's like a, some kind of uh, blight <laughs> or something that, that kills civilization. We are dying because of narcissism. No, I mean, narcissism is an indicator that we are dying. And we are is dying there any... Is there any scope for this to be reversed or retracted or that there will be some kind of, you know, realization that we, we need to modify our ways and modify how we live and how we live most of our lives online? Um, I know I'm saying this as we speak on an online platform, but again, I, f I feel it's almost got to a point where people are losing the, the ability to interact normally. Listen, I'm... Um an old Moroccan Middle Eastern patriarchal um, bully. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure I'm woke enough to answer this. But, um, there, I want there, the non-woke answer. The non-woke answer. There's a, simple, there's a simple fact. Children, having children meaning means choosing life. And people are not having children. What they're having instead is iPhones and Netflix, and a lot of cats. There's a proliferation of cats. People have given so. up People have given up on reality, and if, uh, above there, uh, over and above there, they've given up on other people. People consider the cost of associating with other people as far higher than the reward of associating with other people. So they've chosen atomization, they've chosen singlehood, they've chosen isolation, and 42%, that's not a joke, half of all adults have chosen this. And ultimately, I think all of us will end up this way. So we are embedded in a death cult. How do, we know that, how do you know that you are in a death cult? When material possessions become far more important than human life. When money, profit, business, commerce, commodities, products, services economy, the growth of the economy, they have become much more important in human life. You're in a death cult because you elevate and you worship inanimate objects, which is a great definition of death. So we are embedded in, uh, Western civilization has become a death cult. And we are in a downward spiral of a death cult. I don't see this as a, as a negative thing at all. I think it's high time that we exit left, left stage. You know, it's high time. If you look back, five hundred years, let's say the last five hundred years, we haven't been beneficial, not to the planet, not to other people, colonialism, not to each other. We failed. It's a failed experiment. We have simply failed. We have created artificial environments such as cities. We try to survive in them. We failed in that too. Pollution. It's a bloody mess. I think I'm we fail a, mostly. Sorry? I think we fa fail mostly in the fact that we give our time, most of our time, um, to make money and our youth to make money. 
And by the time we reach a point in our lives where we can spend that money, we don't have any time left. It's it's almost like a a catch. It's a it's a game. Uh, it's it's not a the catch, game that you will such, you'll always death. lose the game. Yeah, it's you will lose the death. game every time. You're choosing death. That's the choice of death. When you choose money over life, that's death. That's you choose death. So because reality is intolerable and unbearable, we evade, avoid, and escape reality into the internet, into social media, into the metaverse, into into making money, workaholism. Into we do everything in our power to avoid each other and to avoid life. Good. Time to call it quits. I think. Let's let let's let other civilizations and alternatives emerge. Luckily for humanity, there are alternatives to Western civilization. Many of them are, are egregiously horrible. And but some of them are very interesting. For example, I think in Africa there are quite a few civilizational alternatives which could be much more conducive to choosing life over death. I, I think, think also Asia can have some interesting some parts of Asia. Interesting yeah. Some yeah, some parts of Asia, Africa, um, you know, some some places in South America as well, outside of the, you know, well well worn track. In human history is the story of the fight between life and death. And human beings are agents. They have to make a choice, not only between good and evil as religion have, have it, has it, but they will make a choice between life and death. Life is not an automatic choice, like all of us think. Many of us choose death. Many of us choose death, that we biologically process food and, you know, with the inevitable outcomes in the toilet, that doesn't make us alive. That doesn't make us alive. That's not life. What would you say makes us alive? Life is about challenging yourself to change despite the fear that attends upon change and transformation. I think that's the best definition of life. And change, to change, requires you to have access to reality. Otherwise, otherwise you, you, you will die. You know, uh, A good appraisal and grasp of reality. So you need to be in touch. You need to be in contact. Life is about contact. Life is about change. Life is about fighting off fear and other negative emotions. And above all, life is about enabling each other to grow and to and to become who we are, the process of becoming. Today we don't do any of this. Any of this. When we are in relationships, they devolve into power plays and mind games. And so on. We don't. That's we don't so encourage. sad. Sorry. Yeah. That's why. That's why it's so sad because I feel the institution of marriage and relationships have become a power play. It's become a competition, and ultimately, it's it's not loving or enjoyable. Which which begs the question: What is the point? Yes, and this is a good summary of the state of mind of Western civilization. What's the point? <laughs> I think we have reached. We have reached the point of saying there's no point. And what's, uh, you mentioned cats earlier, lots and lots of cats. Um, are, are they not the least psychopathic am animal to choose as a pet? Not according to recent studies. According to recent studies, really? cats are absolutely psychopathic. Actually, I have a video on my YouTube channel. Is your cat a psychopath? <laughs> I really need to watch this. I'm pretty sure my cat is a psychopath um, yeah. and I can't believe I've missed it. So I definitely have to check this one out. <laughs> Ask any mouse. Most mice would agree. I mean, They would, but they. I, I feel that a lot of people choose cats because unlike dogs, they don't give you that unconditional, they're not all up in your business. They're not, you know, they don't give you that unconditional love where they um, jump up on you the minute you're in the room. You have to, You have to work for a cat's love. They give you space. They yeah, give they give space. you space. They're not as demanding. They're not as demanding. They give you space. Modern dating for you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Perfect. It's... Modern relationships. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
cats, dogs, Netflix, these are all ways of, these are all substitutes. These are all substitutes. We are living in ersatz, an ersatz world, a world of imitation and fakery. And it's not a real world. It's what Baudrillard called the society of the spectacle. It's all a theater. It's all a Truman show. It's an enormous matrix or theater production. None of it is real. I think that's what we are feeling, all of us are feeling that none of it is real. That's why you have these conspiracy theories and these people are trying to desperately get to the reality of it. They don't trust reality. They say, can't, this can't be reality. There must be something behind it. This can't be true. And yet, it is true. The biggest conspiracy of all is that the reality we see, shockingly, is absolutely true. It's not a reality that I think many people want to continue to live in in this manner. I, I don't feel, uh, certainly in the UK, there's any kind of future for the millennial generation that have just, um, you know, come into their 30s. That they're, they're not, you know, they've worked very hard to get to where they want to be, a lot of them. And we're reaching a point where our careers, our relationships, our way of living, uh, it's not, it's not sustainable. It's not... It doesn't fill us with excitement or joy. And we've reached a point where even earning, you know, the UK average wage of 34,000 isn't enough to keep a small um, barren household going for a month. So it, it, what to me, it feels very much, especially after the pandemic, that our economy and our, our wages, that they're, they're not aligned and, and our lives are, are just, as you say, you know, it's a Truman show, it's a spectacle, yeah, a very we depressing the, spectacle. We live, the, we live at the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. During the Industrial Revolution, the owners of factories earned hundreds of times more than the workers. So there was income inequality started with the Industrial Revolution. Didn't exist before. Um, and so... We live at this age where the elites are sacrificing the masses and ignoring ignoring them. And so the masses opt out. It's a giant opt out. Western, Western civilization is a giant opt out. You know, people opt out through drugs, through alcohol, through Netflix, through cats. Through, they opt out. Simply opt out. Did you have children to pick up or something? Indeed, I do. But yes, I've, I've got distracted. Um, it's been fascinating, as always, um, Doctor. And even though we went off topic there, I feel that was a very relevant um, sidetrack. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Anytime. Yeah. See you again but soon, yeah. I hope. Yeah, see you again soon. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to check out the cat video. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.